This video is part three of my series on semiconductors. The first video, of course, uh, dealt with the structure of the band theory. The second video dealt with understanding intrinsic semiconductors. And if you watched that video, you would have noted that the way we can manipulate the conductivity of a semiconductor, namely if we've been dealing with silicon, is that we increase the temperature and that allows electrons to move from the valency band to the conduction band, uh, jumping its small forbidden gap. Now that is, seems okay in terms of increasing temperature can therefore increase the conductivity of the material, but it is actually quite limiting. So in this third video, I'm going to look specifically at how we form extrinsic semiconductors and how, how they're formed by the process of what we call doping. So let's remind ourselves quickly of what silicon looks like. And as I told you that silicon provides four electrons uh, into its valency band. And of course, of course, what happens is that we have not only four valency electrons, but we then automatically also have a sharing going on um, as well. So um, in this case, I had one more electron here. So I'm just going to quickly copy that extra uh, electron. So copy and duplicate. Here we go. Here we go. And then we have now one extra electron there. Great. So um, we now have uh, an outer shell, our valency cell that's four. And if you remember our discussion, that if I move one of these electrons over here and it goes into the conduction band, then automatically I leave a bit of a positive hole over here. But as I said, the, the only way we can do that is by increasing its temperature. Now, what happens though is if I were to take this silicon out and replace it with another element. In this case, I'm replacing it with phosphorus. And in this case, this phosphorus has, um, it's clearly providing four electrons to bond with its neighboring silicon atoms. But as most of you know, phosphorus does not have four electrons in its outer valency band, it has five. And so now all of a sudden we have this extra electron available. Now, uh, this extra electron, of course, will make sure that this area here is neutral because phosphorus, of course, has 15 protons. But this electron over here is not used as a covalent bond electron or sharing um, situation. So it is actually quite free to move. Um, now, it's still bound, but the amount of energy required for it to remove and move away from the phosphor atom is significantly smaller than the 1.1 electron volts that these particular electrons need. So a very small increase uh, in temperature will cause this electron to move away and, as we know in the band th structure, will go into the conduction band. And the secondly, of course, this electron not only is now in the conduction band, hopefully, but we're not leaving any holes behind whatsoever. Now, yes, it is slightly positive over here, but there's no holes in, in terms of the band structure. So that's one way we can change the situation in terms of making this material a little bit more conductive by providing extra electrons that are much easier to move to the conduction band. The other thing is if we replace it with, let's say, boron. Now, boron in this case has only three electrons in its valency band. So this would be more representative of the situation. Automatically, although this area is neutral, we now actually have a hole here. And if you remember from my previous video, along applied difference, conduction can occur by the movement of holes. Now, there's not a flow of electrons, let's be clear about that, but obviously what we can do is we can shift the direction of the hole by a neighboring electron just shifting to the next one. But of course that will create a hole here and then moving this one creates a hole here. And you can see simply by having two electrons just move to the neighboring bond means I have a shifting hole moving around in the opposite direction. So by either adding phosphorus or boron in this case, we have altered the conductivity of our silicon. Now let's have a look a quick as an overview and how that looks like in band structure. So here we have a summary of the two situations I've just described and I've used phosphorus in this case as our um, uh, uh, five valency electron situation and boron here. But as we'll go shortly, you'll notice that uh, both phosphorus 
and uh, uh, boron aren't the only ones I could use. But in terms of the band structure, you can clearly see now I have, uh, if under the right conditions, I have now uh, four or five electrons sitting in the conduction band and I have no holes down here in the valency band and that would be indicative of, uh, with the right amount of energy, uh, phosphorus being doped into the uh, silicon structure and as a result I have um, electrons in the conduction band and no holes, that's really important, no holes in the valency band. Similarly speaking, with boron, we have the reverse. We still, um, in this case, because of the holes that we've generated with the boron, we now have holes in the valency band, but no electrons whatsoever in the conduction band. And that's really significant to understand. And clearly, if you know that if we do the, have the occasional heating uh, electron from the silicon moving an electron into the uh, conduction band for phosphorus, uh, very quickly with the, such a surplus number of electrons in the conduction band, that hole is going to be filled pretty quickly. Similarly speaking, I might get a, a electron jumping from the valency band into the conduction band when it's been doped by boron, but with this large amount of holes around, that electron's not going to stay much at all into the conduction band. It's going to basically jump back into the valency band. So let's then have a look how that plays up with in terms of um, uh, its features. So the first thing to understand is, is that um, if it is um, doped with an atom that has five valency electrons, so group five on the periodic table, and three good examples are phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony, um, we call this an n-type because now what we have, of course, are negative charge carriers being available to um, actually conduct. Now, let me just make a note. A lot of diagrams in textbooks and online will put the electrons sitting here. And some of you are going, oh, that can't be possible. How can electrons exist in the forbidden gap? And understand that this is not actually a physical description. What it's trying to represent is that we have these electrons here that only need a really small amount of energy to move into the conduction band. Um, much smaller than the huge amount of elect um, energy that these guys have. And so the way to represent that we have, uh, I guess, less energy available, and in terms of silicon, this can only be 0.05 electron volts. And if you remember, intrinsic semiconductors is 1.1 electron volts. The way we can draw it is just below it. But understand, this is not saying that they're existing in the forbidden gap. So four electrons are used for the covalent bonds and we have one left over. Now it's interesting to note, when we do this, um, the uh, conduction is usually increased. So for example, if we have silicon and we dope it um, in a ratio of one antimony atom for every 10, um, sorry, 100 million silicon atoms, that basically yields about five times 10 to the power of 16 conduction electrons per cubic centimeter at room temperature. Now, if you remember the number from previously that I had in my video, that is actually a factorial in a factor increase of five million. So now that simply having one, let me say that again, simply having one antimony atom for every 100 million silicon atoms, we increase the conductivity material by five million. That's quite significant. So what happens, of course, therefore, in conduction? Well, if we apply a potential difference or an electric field across that, of course, we therefore have these electrons moving in the conduction band. And of course, what is the, if you remember that the um, electrons will always move towards a positive plate, so the electrons will move in that direction. Um, of course, it's still important to remember a conventional current is always from the positive plate to the negative plate, so it would be in this direction. So in an n-type, the electrons migrate in, as we would expect, in the opposite direction to the conventional current. So what about p-type? We call this acceptor as opposed to donor for n-type. And in this case, we have group three atoms, and they, uh, I gave boron as an example, but aluminium, uh, gallium, and indium can also be used. Again, the important thing to note is here that as a result of the large surplus number of holes, we don't have any 
uh, in the uh, valency band, we don't have any electrons in the conduction band. And we call this a p-type because what we now have, of course, is we have positive charge carriers actually going to be the, the responsibility for allowing current to flow. Now, again, if you remember, positive charge carriers, we don't have actually electrons moving, but they move from side to side to the next bond. And as a result, we have a migration of holes in the opposite direction. Um, and then, as I said, three of the um, electrons in these three valency electron uh, atoms uh, are used for bonding, but of course, we still have one uh, hole left over. So what happens then, of course, when you apply a potential difference or an electric field across it? So again, a quick reminder, you know that conventional current is in this direction. Now, as a result, these electrons in here, and I'll write this really small, they don't actually flow in that direction. But of course, what they're doing is skipping across in that direction to a nearby um, hole. As a result, if you were to watch the hole move, that hole, that positive hole, would actually move in the opposite direction. And that makes it consistent with our understanding of conventional current. Because conventional current, of course, is the flow of positive charge, as historically determined. And so what we then say is with a p-type, the main conductor, the conduction is achieved by the positive charge carriers. Okay. So quickly revise, if you have an n-type, that's a donor, and the predominant charge carrier are the negative charge carriers through the movement of electrons in the conduction band, and the p-type is where you have conduction predominantly provided by the positive charge carriers in the valency band. So why is that helpful? Well, of course, as a result, by simply fine tuning the amount of impurities into the silicon, or the germanium for that matter, you can tune the conductivity and notice now temperature is no longer a factor. So you can be very specifically tuned how you want it. You can choose, obviously, which is your majority carrier. Do you want an electron or a negative charge carrier or a hole, a positive charge carrier to be your majority carrier of current? And finally, which we'll, I'll discuss in sub, another video, is when you join the two together, you can actually make diodes and transistors. So really, functionally, by themselves, they don't have a huge amount of uh, functional use. But when we sandwich them together, both the p-type and the n-type in various configurations, we can get some very cool features indeed. I hope that video, this video has been helpful. Please subscribe to my channel if you like and want to hear some more physics explained high school style. And until uh, next time, take care. Bye.